You shouldn't bring any of it back. Look what happened when Prometheus took fire from the heavens and gave it to the people of the world. We've burned a lot in exchange for some warmth. I remember one of the scientists at NASA saying that to me when I was developing their latest Mars rover. They had been furious at the time, but they were fired shortly after their outburst, which has been for the best. They were wrong then, and they are still wrong now. I'm not Prometheus. I never wanted to steal fire from gods. I just wanted to collect a few rocks from Mars and bring them back to Earth. And now that's finally happening. I can't stop looking at the night sky. The little red dot hanging up there among all of the stars is what my whole life has been about. My whole career, decades of my life, has been committed to not only touching that little red dot, but bringing some of it back home for the world to see. It's a big day for you, a historic day. I hardly hear the 16th NASA administrator, Charlie Carvalho. I hope he doesn't think I'm ignoring him. I just can't take my eyes away from the distant planet just barely visible in the constellation so high above us. To think that this will be the first rover that has ever ventured to Mars and come back, just like you designed it to be able to do. All of your hard work is paying off, even when they said it couldn't be done. You should be proud of yourself. We will finally have physical samples from Mars' surface to actually study here. I don't really know what to say, so I keep it simple. Thank you, sir. I'm trying not to let the enormity of the accomplishment weigh down on me too much. I know what I built is a huge step forward for our research on our neighboring planet. Still, it's hard to really wrap my head around the fact that I created something which might be the key to so much new information. Rovers, as NASA has called them, have been sent to Mars for decades. We don't yet have the proper technology to send a manned space vessel to the Red Planet, but we've managed to send robotic apparatuses that we can control on the surface. The rovers have always been helpful in documenting images from the surface of Mars and exploring its landscape to give us a better idea about what's out there. They have all been wonderful accomplishments in their own right. Sojourner, spirit, opportunity, curiosity, perseverance. Each rover that's been sent through the vast darkness of outer space and touched down on an entirely different planet has been a miracle of science and human ingenuity. I will never smear any of the previous missions or the rovers that did the jobs that they were designed for, but none of them come even close to how advanced Marvin is. While the previous rovers all bear very uplifting, hopeful, and meaningful names, I fought hard for my creation to stand out from the pack. I gave the rover its name from the Looney Tunes character, probably the most famous Martian in the pop culture zeitgeist. It still feels right to me, even if some of the more pretentious people in my workplace wanted to call it something else. I remember people suggesting reliant, or determination, or willpower, and all of the suggestions made me want to throw up. I refuse to let something that I was spearheading be given such an inflated name. No, my rover was always going to be a real Martian. And unlike its predecessors, it was built so that it could easily launch back up to an orbiting ship and come back home. And now it's finally entering Earth's atmosphere for its return journey. We're on our way to intercept it at its determined crash site in the middle of the Nevada desert. Hopefully the samples of minerals that it collected and is bringing home will be undamaged after its landing. I'm not too worried. I designed it to be able to make a soft touchdown back to Earth, and hopefully it wouldn't malfunction. We'll see. The barren desert of sand we're driving through is probably the closest thing that we have to the landscape of Mars, but it still pales in comparison, I'm sure. To think that the thing that I spent years of my life putting together had spent time up there. Are you worried at all? No, I say. But it's not entirely true. There's always a part of me that's going to prepare myself for the worst. I would be foolish not to at least consider that something could go horribly wrong. I don't want anyone to see that, though. I want them to know that I believe in what I designed. 
I took everything I needed to into account when I built it. I'm sure you did. To think that we've gotten those other rovers still out there, rolling around on the red rock, and yours will be the first one to come home. It changes the whole game. I can feel my face getting warm. I'm not the kind of person that likes attention or getting compliments. It just makes me feel awkward. Thank you, sir. You know, I told all the higher-ups for years that there's nothing to worry about on that planet. It's just a rock at this point. And maybe someday we'll be able to bring it back to life and make it flourish. But for now, there's nothing there. They just let the 2015 incident spook them too much. It was the first I'd ever heard of a 2015 incident. What do you mean? What happened? Charles laughs. laughs. No one ever told you about that? I started development on Marvin in 2028, a full 13 years after whatever he's talking about. I suppose that makes sense, Charles says, still chuckling. It was kept pretty quiet. We didn't want to cause a panic over what was probably nothing. I hate that he's beating around the bush. I prod a little. Come on. It was just a little mishap one day with one of the rovers up there. Curiosity. I think that was the one. Yes, that was it. Curiosity. You know what they say about curiosity killing cats. It also apparently scares NASA administrators too. <laughs> he starts laughing again. I don't. Well, one day, something struck curiosity. It nearly knocked it over. All of NASA was thrown into chaos about it. They were panicking that we were about to lose one of our rovers. I was there that day. Everyone was saying that something struck it from below, from under the surface. If you ask me, I still think there was just some rock under the dirt. But it was the video footage from that day that really concerned people. What was it? Charles pushes his glasses up his nose. I can see the memories coming to him behind those spectacles. He's seeing whatever he saw then, and I can see a flash of real fear behind the lenses. Some kind of shadow crawling around near the rover. It prompted a whole lot of debate, I'll tell you that much. Full-on shouting matches broke out that day. Some thought it was evidence of life on Mars. Some thought it was just some trick of the lens. I fell into the latter camp, and I'm still in that camp. It was too hard to tell. We kept it quiet until we could find more evidence, and we never did. The rovers just kept doing their thing up there, and they haven't ever found anything like that again. Because there was never anything actually there. Charles is very convinced about that, but I can see something else on his face. He's not able to entirely erase the unease from his expression as he recounted what happened back then. 2015 was a long time ago, and nothing's come of it. I told them, and thanks to you, now we'll really have something to show for all of our work and for the decades NASA has spent exploring our red neighbor. The first samples. I can't wait. Sometime later, we stood in the intended landing spot, staring up at the sky. That's when I saw something up there growing closer, descending down from the starscape above. It's almost magical to watch something come down from the heavens, especially since it's something that came out of my brain. The pod looks to be in good condition and made it through the atmosphere in one piece. It's a relief to know that it didn't burn up on re-entry. Hopefully the shielding was able to keep the rover safe inside. I don't want to open it up to find that Marvin has melted. The rest of the retrieval team joins us, pulling up in their large trucks and running around with their equipment. It's hard to tell everyone apart in our hazmat suits, but it's better to be safe than sorry. Once they open up the landing pod, we get a chance to see what's inside. Marvin looks like he's in good condition. He didn't melt during re-entry, and its time on Mars hadn't put it through too much damage, thankfully. Considering that it has been traveling across the galaxy, it looks almost in as good of condition as the last time I saw it. I built it to be able to endure a lot of punishment because of needing to go back and forth between planets, and I'm glad that my designs seem to have paid off. It's a good feeling to see it back home in one piece. 
the image of Marvin the Martian wearing his bristled helmet and skirt, with his ray gun in hand, is still painted onto one of the sides of the rover's frame. I wanted the rover's namesake to join it on its journey. It's just my kind of humor. There's something else too. Something that wasn't there when we first launched Marvin into space. It must have picked up some new scratches on its harsh journey through the cosmos, but the marks on it immediately make me feel a strange unease. They don't look like scuffs from flying through space debris. They don't even look like they came from the rover scraping against some boulder. It's a few narrow lines running almost parallel to each other, like some kind of claw mark. It can't be right. Nothing on Mars can scratch the rover like this because there is nothing there that can do anything at all. It's just rocks and a couple of other machines. What is it? Charles asks beside me. I don't want to alarm him, especially after what he told me about the rover in 2015. This is a happy day. I don't want to spoil it by bringing up a couple of weird scratch marks right now. It's nothing. The convoy brings Marvin to the designated research base nearby, where we are well equipped to see what the rover brought home. It's an impressive facility, specifically designed to give us a quarantined and sterile place to examine the things that come from another planet. It's unclear how potentially hazardous the materials might be, so it's better to be safe than sorry. We continue to take the necessary precautions before handling the returned rover. I'm getting used to the hazmat suit after wearing it for so many hours. I know some of the others are annoyed to have to wear them, but we're dealing with potentially very hazardous material. I don't mind putting a thin membrane between myself and the samples. The head technician, Dr. Myron Cross, is allowing me to take part in the study of the samples since I'm the reason that they even have anything to study. After bringing Marvin into a quarantined lab, all ten of us stand around in our suits as the contents the rover collected are unloaded. Marvin did exactly what I programmed it to do. It used its built-in scoopers to dig up a great deal of dirt from the surface of Mars. I didn't want to just have it bring back a few little samples. I wanted it to bring us more than we needed. It gave us buckets worth of dirt, dust, and minerals. A bounty for us to study as the first ever samples brought back from Mars's surface. Not to mention, we also have the residue we can glean from the rover's treads. It leaves us with a mound of Martian dirt and rock. Truly remarkable, Dr. Cross says. He turns to me. You really outdid yourself. He approaches the pile of material first, taking a bit of sand in his hand to get a closer look at it. He's the first human being to touch Mars. He turns back to the team of scientists in the room. This is absolutely a monumental day for humankind. We may not have set foot on Mars yet, but we brought some of that planet to us. And now it's our job to really look at what we have here. I want everyone to be thorough. I want everyone to be careful. And I want you all to understand the importance of all of this. So let's... The pile of orange sand suddenly shifts and speckles of dirt flow down from the top of the mound, catching us all off guard. Dr. Cross takes another step toward it and reaches out to the dirt. He wants to see what's inside the pile, and I don't blame him. Dr. Cross is stuck in place, screaming from within his hazmat suit. He's trying to pull away, but something inside the pile is holding him there. He's desperately trying to pry his arm away, but it's got him. Help me! He groans. For the love of God, help me! We all hurry to him, but everyone stops when the mound of sand shifts suddenly, sliding away and revealing what is hiding within. A shape emerges from the pile of orange dirt. The specks of sand run down, washing off of the thing coming out of it until I can get a clearer look at it. It's a Martian, but it doesn't look like any Martian that I've ever imagined. It's not a little green spaceman with a bulbous head. It's not a hulking gargantuan figure. It's definitely not the helmeted, skirted, and stammering form of Marvin the Martian either. It's about the size of a dog. It looks somewhere between a scorpion and some horrible long-legged spider. A series of pincers wrap around its mouth, clicking. Its three sharp tails rise up over its head, hanging over its body threateningly. 
Its spindly, segmented limbs, all ten of them, stretch out as the scientists around me back away from the table. I stay where I am. My feet feel like they're stuck to the floor. I don't know exactly why I'm frozen, whether it's amazement, fear, or simply wanting to get as close of a look at the creature as I possibly can. I don't want to miss anything. Every little move it makes is a historic moment for our planet. The creature is proof that there is life on other planets, that we're not alone in the universe. Its existence changes everything we have ever known. There is an overwhelming sense of awe in the room. We know nothing about it. It's exciting but frightening. The unknown is always so unnerving. But our astonishment is quickly deafened by Dr. Cross's screams. The claw that's clasped around his wrist tightens its grip, and I hear bones breaking beneath its grasp. The scientist collapses to one knee, groaning and sobbing in pain. People close in to try to help him, but hesitate to get within reach of the Martian's claws as the other one snaps threateningly in our direction. It keeps squeezing the doctor's wrist until I hear even more flesh and bone being torn and crushed. Then with a sudden jerk, the creature's claw rips Dr. Cross's hand from his arm. Blood pours from his limb as he collapses to the floor, and panic immediately sets in as the thing in front of us skitters around the floor on its spindly legs. It leaves a trail of dirt and blood in its wake as it crawls across the floor. Holy shit! Someone yells. Kill it! Kill it! Yells another. It's all happening so fast, but it's clear that our first contact isn't going to be a friendly one. We aren't dealing with something we can reason with. It wants to kill, and we're all boxed into a room with it. It clicks its pincers and claws while its scorpion-like tails rattle. I can almost feel its intent radiating off of its body. It's just standing there thinking, probably deciding which one of us it wants to attack next. When one of the scientists makes a move toward it with a scalpel, the creature responds before any of us have a chance to react. It's suddenly on top of its next victim, overwhelming him with all of its legs, grabbing at him with its claws, and stabbing him with its many sharp tails. The lab turns into absolute chaos and carnage in a matter of seconds. The alien is fast, skittering and leaping around the room, latching onto people and pulling them apart. People are trying to hurry out of the lab as quickly as they can, but with everyone trying to push through at once, it's slowing everyone down. It doesn't help that we're all terrified, trying to escape with our lives. The Martian doesn't want us to leave, though, and grabs two more people that are trying to push their way to the exit. It's close to me now, and I hear them being torn to pieces behind me. Thankfully, I got through the door with just three other members of the research team. However, one of them, a man named Fallon, is pulled back into the lab by his ankle just as the door seals shut. We watch through the observation glass as he meets the same fate as the others. The Martian rips him to shreds in a matter of seconds. We need to keep this thing contained! One of the scientists yells. Obviously! I called back. I'm not sure that we even can. Its speed and strength are unreal, unlike any animals of its size on Earth. How the hell did you let this happen? A scientist, Dr. Saval, I believe his name is, suddenly yells pinning me up against the glass. How could your rover bring something like that back with it? What kind of sensors did you have on that thing? It must have been covered by the amount of debris it had on top of it. The sensors didn't pick it up during the collection because of the sheer amount of minerals around it. It must have been buried deep, some sort of subterranean dwelling creature, I surmise, trying to writhe out of his grasp. His eyes are wide with fury. I wish that he wasn't blaming me for this, but I understand the instinct to do that, especially after just watching his colleagues get slaughtered in front of him. It's a lot to process, and in times of panic, people need someone to blame. Well, your blunder is already getting people killed, Dr. Saval shouts. Your machine should have been more thorough during its sample collection. Then none of this would have happened. Instead, you brought something terrible back home. The only other survivor from the lab, Dr. Harris, grabs hold of Saval's shoulder and gently pulls him away from me. We can't turn on each other right now. We need to not only make sure that that thing stays in the lab, but it would be best if we can find a way to dispose of it before it hurts anyone else. We have a few options, Saval says, glancing at a red button on the console nearby. 
He lets me go and moves toward it, reaching his hand out. We can douse it in a chemical shower and see if that does anything to it. Hopefully it burns the son of a bitch. You can't do that! I snap, rushing over to block his path. Raining chemicals down on everything in the lab is going to destroy the samples. That's what you're worried about right now? Dr. Saval growls. We've got bigger things to worry about than a bunch of rocks. Those samples are already useless as far as I'm concerned. Your robot was never supposed to bring back a monster with it. Exactly! I'm desperately fighting not only for the dignity of my creation, but also for my own reputation. It brought back even more than it was supposed to. It brought back proof of aliens on other planets. It brought back life! Dr. Saval lets out a roar and shoves me out of the way. Life? Look in that room! All it brought is death! I land against the observation glass and see the creature desperately trying to find a way out of the lab. The entire space has been stained red with splatters of blood and piles of body parts. Our colleagues are so mutilated that they don't even look like people anymore. Maybe Dr. Saval is right. Maybe all of my doubters at the start of all of this were right too. Maybe I am Prometheus and I've brought something disastrous to humankind. Dr. Saval punches the emergency button on the console. I don't try to stop him anymore. All I've been trying to do is bring something from Mars, but I never wanted this. It might be for the best that we just get rid of all of it. The sprinklers on the ceiling of the lab unleash the hailstorm of chemicals. The shower pours down on everything inside, including the scorpion-like Martian that seems completely unbothered by everything being poured onto it. It barely even seems to notice. After not finding another way out, it continues to throw itself against the door as the chemical shower rains down. My heart sinks at the sight of the mound of Martian dirt being washed away by the liquid. It's all falling apart, and the chemicals are making every grain of those samples utterly useless to further study. In the end, it seems Marvin's mission has actually turned out to be a failure in some respects. I try to hold on to the fact that my rover discovered alien life. As violent and terrifying as the alien has turned out to be, it has to count for something. While I continue to see the creature slam against the door, my attention remains transfixed on the dissipating minerals, but that's when I see something unusual in its place. When the dirt is washed away, it leaves something in its place, something that was apparently buried beneath it, just like the creature was. They are large black orbs, seven of them all laying in the spot where they had just been buried by all of the rocks and dirt. It's hard to make out details through all of the liquid spraying everywhere, but I can see one thing clearly. The orbs are moving around, and they're cracking. I suddenly realize what we are looking at. They are eggs, and they're hatching. The Martian isn't alone. It might even be a parent. The door to the lab rocks violently and starts to open. It's breaking through. The Martian is going to get out. Its eggs are about to hatch and unleash even more of the creatures. One was able to cause so much carnage, so I shudder at the thought of what even more will do. We'll be overwhelmed for sure. They're not supposed to be here, and I'm the one that brought them. Now I need to be the one to make sure that they never leave this lab. We can't let the alien out of the lab, especially now that even more of them are about to hatch. Who knows what will happen if they get out of the facility? Considering what just one of them was able to do to a room full of people, there is no telling what kind of damage they might be able to do to the rest of society if they get out, especially if even more of them are birthed. I wish my rover never collected any samples from Mars. We could have just left these things up there in the dust, buried in the dirt, but now we've brought something horrible into our home. It's just myself, Dr. Saval, and Dr. Harris remaining from the team that was supposed to start researching the samples Marvin collected from Mars' surface. The Martians aren't what most people would expect, I imagine. They aren't little green men with ray guns trying to fight us with flying saucers. They're feral, vicious animals that can rip a human to pieces in a matter of seconds. With their spindly 10 legs, three scorpion-like tails, pincered mouths, and claws, they look like abominations and perversions of some of our own species here on Earth. 
We can't let them leave this facility, I mutter again. Dr. Saval and Dr. Harris understand the risks of this, just like I do. There's no telling what will happen to the planet if unknown creatures like this, a species we know nothing about, infiltrates our ecosystem. We know so few factors about how they operate and behave, outside of seeing how incredibly hostile they are. We haven't had the chance to study them at all, and we can't determine if they're carrying something contagious or harmful to other species either. You're right, Dr. Harris said. It could be disastrous. Then they're not going anywhere, Dr. Sabal shouts as he braces against the metal door the creature is trying to bust open. The door is the only thin membrane between us and guaranteed death. If it gets through, will be pulled to pieces just like the creature did to all of the other scientists in the lab. Come on, help me! Harris joins him against the door. I'm about to help barricade it with my body, but my attention is drawn to the reinforced window into the lab. I can still see all of the mangled bodies of the other scientists. It isn't the corpses that I pay much attention to. It's the alien eggs on the lab table. They're not buried beneath the mound of Martian dirt anymore. They're exposed. Worst of all, they're rocking and cracking open. They're larger than most eggs I've ever seen from any animal on Earth, already the size of rodents. It's unbelievable. I can't take my eyes away from it. The eggs crack open. The familiar lobster-like claws and scorpion-like tails emerge from the shells, breaking them apart and tearing themselves free. The alien creatures seem to be born into the world violently, already almost fully formed. They emerge from their eggs and skitter around the room on their many legs, picking at the human cadavers around them. The first alien, the more mature one, still throws its full weight at the laboratory door. It's strong, nearly strong enough to knock the doctors away from holding it back. It's this sight that snaps me back into the present. That and Dr. Saval screaming at me. Don't just stand there! Help us! I rush to their aid and press myself against the door. I finally feel for myself how strong the Martian is as each time it strikes the door. I can feel the barrier almost give way, and I'm almost thrown back myself. It's taking every bit of strength I have to help my colleagues keep the creature at bay. I glance over at the lab window and see some of the newborn aliens rush over toward the door. Suddenly, there's even more force striking us. The other aliens are joining their elder adding their own strength to his own by throwing themselves at the door too. God damn it! Dr. Saval cries out. We can't hold this thing for much longer. What are we supposed to do? We can fall back into the facility, I say. There's more people that could help us, other scientists. Not many, Dr. Harris says through clenched teeth as he presses his back against the door. This base and what's inside of it are classified and we only keep a small crew around to man it. Most of the people that did are on the other side of this door. Then we round up who we can to help. I refuse to give up or accept defeat. There's only about 10 of them. We can do this. I'm trying to convince myself of my own words, but I've seen firsthand what one can do. While the new ones are newborns, they don't seem like helpless babies either. The dented metal door rocks hard and is nearly ripped off its hinges, but we just managed to keep it in place. Some of the things snapping claws squeeze through the opening. They try to grab us, but we just manage to avoid them. It's more clear than ever that we're losing ground. We need help. Go, Dr. Harris says. I'll keep holding the door as long as I can. That's insane, Dr. Saval says. You won't be able to do it for long. No, but hopefully long enough to buy you two some time. I open my mouth to argue with him, but he won't hear it. Go, now, before they kill all of us. Okay, I say, relenting a little. Thank you, Harris. Just don't let them get out of the building, yeah? I nod. We'll do our best. Dr. Saval and I begrudgingly step from the door and hurry out of the room. I take one last look over my shoulder as I close the door to the next room. I see Dr. Harris pushing the door with all of his might, but it's not enough. He doesn't have long. Once we run through the next room, out into the hall, I hear Dr. Harris. I won't forget the sacrifice he made. He clearly saw the bigger picture, just like I do. We can't let them out into the world, but it sounds like they made it out of the lab. We close and lock as many doors as we can behind us. 
anything to slow them down. Dr. Sabal hits an emergency alert button on the wall. Most of the staff here might have already been killed, but at least we can warn the rest and rally everyone together. We sprint out into the main entranceway of the facility, where there are a couple of scientists gathering around, looking concerned. What the hell is going on in this place? Charles Carvalho storms into the area. The current NASA administrator went to collect Marvin with me, but left the scientists to our own devices to look at the samples. He missed a lot in the hour since we last saw each other. I collect myself. Sir, it appears that our rover didn't just collect inorganic samples on Mars. It inadvertently scooped up something living too. What do you mean? Like an actual alien life form? Exactly. He perks up, even starting to smile. That's good news then. It would be if it didn't butcher most of our research team in a matter of minutes. His grin fades away and concern washes over his face instead. It's killed? Oh, yes, Dr. Saval says through his heavy, exasperated breaths. It's killed, and it's not alone now. A bunch of eggs were collected with it, and those have hatched now too. Charles's eyes flicker in my direction. He points his finger right in my face. How could you let this happen? Me? Yes, you. You built a machine that brought it here. You're telling me that your robot couldn't detect that it was carrying living cargo in that dust bucket? We designed Marvin under the assumption that there was no life on Mars, at least not anything large and dangerous. Maybe if you had told me about what happened in 2015 a little bit earlier, I could have taken that into account. Ah, so now it's my fault? No, you designed the rover. You assured me that it would be able to do its job. It did! It collected the samples and brought them back to Earth. How are we supposed to know that it might scoop up something and bring it with it? Is that what you're going to tell the families of the men in that lab? How was I supposed to know? Really? We won't have a chance to tell anyone anything if those things get through any more barricades. If they get out of the facility, there's no telling what will happen next. Charles is hearing me. I can see it on his face, but I can also see that he's still upset with me. He probably still blames me for all of this but he sees the bigger picture just like I do. No matter who was really to blame, we all had a part in bringing the Martian creatures here to Earth. It's our mess to clean up. Okay, fine, the NASA administrator says. We must make sure that those aliens don't leave this lab. We deal with the rest of the fallout after. He turns to Dr. Saval. Are there any weapons in this place? Dr. Saval shakes his head. Unfortunately not, sir. I can't say that we ever expected that we would have to fight monsters like them. We didn't keep an armory or anything like that. All we have is what's around us, and it's not much. I see a potential weapon out of the corner of my eye and punch out the glass in the wall where our emergency fire tools are kept. Next to the extinguisher, I find a fire axe. It's the best weapon around compared to anything else in the room. I doubt that the axe will be able to do much against the specimens trying to come out of the lab. The Martian creatures have already shown how ferocious they really are. It sounds like other people in the facility have been found by the aliens. We look down the hall and find the pack of Martians rushing through the corridor, surging toward us like a stream of disgusting flesh. The one Martian creature had been enough, but now we have nine to deal with. They all keep close together and form a swarm of snapping claws, rattling tails, and spindly legs. All of the pincers around their mouths click excitedly while they close in on us. I'm sorry, Charles mutters beside me. He stares at the aliens with utter disbelief. I should have told you about what they saw in 2015. I should have believed them when they said that there could be something dangerous on Mars. I just, I just wanted us to be really explorers again, to be bold, to be unafraid. It's clear just from his expression that Charles is the furthest thing from unafraid now. He is horrified, too scared to even move. He can't even begin to process the mass of murderous flesh coming in our direction. The bodies of the aliens look like a wave of death that will wash over us in about 20 seconds. We need to keep moving, I say firmly, hoping to snap him out of his petrified stupor. We need to go right now. It doesn't matter, he says. This isn't what I wanted but it's our fault. Charles, come on! This isn't the time for this! If we stay here any longer... I'm suddenly the one being dragged away by Dr. Saval. 
He pulls me away from Charles, who falls to his knees, completely at the mercy of the oncoming swarm. I shout for him, but he doesn't hear me. It's too late for him, Dr. Sabal yells. He's too far gone. I know he's right, but I still shout for my boss. Charles Carvalho gave me the opportunity of a lifetime when he allowed me to develop Marvin. There's something horrible about my rover, that thing that he let me create, being the instrument that brought about his death. If Marvin hadn't been built, or if it had scooped up a different piece of the Mars landscape, then so many others would be alive. Then the NASA administrator might not die. Dr. Sabal is right about Charles, though. It is too late. The swarm engulfs Charles Carvalho. The 16th NASA administrator disappears beneath all of the claws ripping at him. There is a splash of blood before his entire body disappears beneath the clicking, skittering aliens. It doesn't take them long to end him. Thankfully, my colleague pulls me outside before I have a chance to see what's left of Charles. We lock the front entrance to the facility behind us using the exterior locking functions that only authorized personnel can access. It's a heavy metal door, but so was the one in the quarantine lab. They'll be able to get through, I'm sure of it. The desert is waiting for us. It's a seemingly endless void of sand all around the facility. It is the perfect location for a secret government research facility. If it wasn't overrun with horrible abominations, it might have continued to be an ideal place for the kind of things that we were going to be doing there. Most people will never be able to ask for a better space to work, but now all of it is tainted by the blood of the people that were my co-workers. The swarms of aliens have reached the outer door. They're trying to push through. I see the door's form suddenly puff out, being dented from the force breaking through it. This is just perfect, isn't it? Dr. Saval asks through gritted teeth. We have to drive across a wasteland because we sure as hell can't go back there anymore. We have to stop them, Saval. How? Look at what's happening. We can't stop them. I know you want to protect the rest of the world. I do too, but I don't care about the rest of the world right now. I care about getting out of here in one piece. Let's get to the trucks and get as far away from this place as we can. We can warn people about what's going on. The government, the army, the police, anyone that'll stand more of a chance than us. The door slowly opens. It's metal groans, like it's trying to scream, to warn us about what is about to come out. For a few seconds, nothing emerges from the darkness of the lab. Everything is quiet while we stare through the open doorway, unable to see anything on the other side. We don't hear anything either. There's no sounds of movement. No one is screaming anymore, probably because there isn't anybody left. For about another minute, we stand and wait, all in position to fight if we have to, and I'm sure that we will. Sure enough, I hear a click echo out of the maw of the now abandoned laboratory. I hear another. Then there's a whole chorus. The swarm of Martians are all letting us hear how excited they are to kill us just like they did to our colleagues. The clicking suddenly stops, but only for a moment. When all of those sounds come back, pouring out of the open doorway, it sounds almost like a war cry as it grows closer. Either that, or a cheer of anticipation. Come on! Dr. Saval yells from the truck as it finally roars to life. This is the only way out! He's right. If we stay to fight the Martians, we'll die just like everyone else that they've gotten their claws on. We don't stand a chance. As much as we want to keep them contained, we can't anymore. Now we need to survive. I hurried to the truck. It's the same vehicle that brought the rover to the lab. Things had been so much more hopeful then. I had done something amazing for the world, but now I see the truth. Marvin brought doom to planet Earth, and it's all my fault. Dr. Saval steps hard on the gas pedal. I glance at the side view mirror and see the swarm approaching. They're hunting us, apparently determined to finish their slaughter. Even as we speed up, kicking up dust in our wake, they are somehow keeping up. Faster, I mutter. I'm trying. The eldest and largest alien launches itself onto the side of the truck. It skitters across the body of the vehicle toward us. I roll down the window and hold the ax in my hand firmly, keeping a close eye on the thing in the mirror. Just before it reaches us, 
I swing the axe out the window and strike the body of the many-legged Martian. It hisses and clicks at me in apparent surprise. It's not used to us having a chance to fight back. Get that son of a bitch! Dr. Saval cheers from the wheel. Hit him again! I swing hard, but the alien skitters away over the top of the truck. It comes around to the driver's side window. Dr. Saval doesn't have a chance to react as its three scorpion-like tails lash outward like whips. Their sharp ends pierce his left side, hitting his arm, his collar, and his chest. He groans and barely keeps hold of the wheel. I try to keep the truck steady while he starts to have some kind of reaction to the sting from its tails. Dr. Saval's mouth starts to foam. His eyes grow bloodshot, and when he looks at me, I see him fading away in seconds. Half of his face starts to droop downward, like he's having a stroke. He's gone in a matter of seconds, the victim of some kind of poison. He slumps forward and the truck overturns. I can't stop it from flipping as it topples over into the harsh sands around us. The front of the truck smashes hard against a nearby boulder, damaging the engine as smoke rises from the front of the truck, followed by flames. I'm stunned for a moment, but my panic brings me back to my senses. Dr. Saval's deformed, poisoned body is slumped beside me, dangling upside down by his seatbelt. I crawl from the wreckage out into the desert. I make sure I bring the fire axe with me. I'm surrounded by a swarm of aliens. They skitter around me, slowly closing in on the last of their prey. I raise the axe, knowing that it won't do me much good anymore. It hardly matters. We couldn't keep them contained in the end. Go on then, I yell. Do your worst. I'm the one that brought you here. I'm the one that took you from your home. They probably can't understand me. Even if they can, I doubt that it will mean anything to them, except maybe giving them more reason to want to kill me. The eldest one comes forward, its pincers clicking and its claws snapping excitedly. I can almost feel its bloodlust. It can't be reasoned with, I'm sure. It doesn't belong here, none of them do. My mistake has already cost so many lives. If I'm going to die, maybe I can at least take one of these monsters with me. Maybe if I can kill the oldest one, the others won't have anyone to follow. If he's the ringmaster, then maybe I can still take control of the circus. It creeps closer, its trio of tails rattling behind it. I need to be careful of them. Dr. Saval was killed almost instantly by their stings. I can't let them touch me, or I'll end up just like him. I swipe in its direction with the ax, trying to keep it back. I can sense that it's enjoying itself. I notice the younger aliens hanging back, not joining in. It's like they're an audience, and all this for them is entertainment. I get ready to charge, to bring the ax down with all my might, but I don't get the chance. I'm suddenly thrown off of my feet by a shockwave as the truck explodes beside me. The panicking creatures frantically burrow down into the earth and vanish from sight. Even the largest, eldest one retreats into the ground. The sounds or more likely the fire frightened them. It's probably not something that they've ever experienced before. I'm thankful for that, at least. There really is no stopping them. All of our efforts have been fruitless, and now I'm all alone and entirely helpless. I lay there in the dirt, waiting for them to surface. I expect they'll reemerge and finish me off, but they don't. They don't come back for me. Who knows where they've gone? I know they won't stay down there forever. They'll emerge somewhere else, and when they do, it will be just like when they came out of the mound of collected samples. They'll kill everything in their path. I gasp for air, staring up at the sky. There's nothing that I could have done. I know that this is my fault, but I need to still tell myself that I'm not responsible for this. I need to believe that I'm innocent of whatever is about to happen to my home planet. I should never have gotten involved with any of this, I should never have built Marvin. I should never have wanted to take any pieces of Mars to begin with. It's all just led me to this misery and this pain. I am like Prometheus after all. I deserve to be punished for my transgressions just like he did. Maybe that's what's happening now. Maybe my survival is just so I can suffer for what I've done. A part of me wants the aliens to finish me off, to put an end to all of this guilt and this crippling dread for whatever comes next in the world. I reach up for the red dot up there, glimmering among all of the other stars. Mars. I wish I hadn't ever tried to take some of that red 
and bring it down to all of this green and blue. I should have let it be and left it where it was. We aren't ready to face threats like the things that are now spreading out through the desert. The things that we went up against in the facility are beyond humans. I'm sorry, I say to our neighboring planets as it hangs over my head. I should have just let you be. Now please, please don't let the things growing in your soil take root here. It will completely destroy everything. Ecosystems, people, not to mention the panic that will ensue once people learn that we really aren't alone in the universe. Though I don't think anyone will be happy that the other things out there are rabid, violent, killing machines. That won't go over well. I'm sorry, okay? We should have just let you be. I'm sorry. Mars doesn't respond. Of course it doesn't. It's dead. But the supposedly dead planet still has some life after all. And the life we found has already brought so much death and will only bring more. I'm losing my mind, talking to a planet, waiting for alien life forms to come kill me. It's all too much to process. I just wish none of it happened, but it's too late for regrets like that. I want nothing more than to go back to the lab and destroy Marvin. The new Mars rover is my greatest creation, but it's brought all of this. No, I can't blame that piece of machinery. This was me. It's human nature to want more and to take from others to get it. We have no business taking anything from another planet. It's all supposedly for the sake of science and progress, but in the end, it's really just about greed, like always. Mars is just another piece of land for human beings to exploit. We never should have taken anything from Mars. I climbed to my feet, still staring across the vast wasteland around me. I used to starscape as a guide, though I've never been good at using them for navigation. Besides, my eyes keep wandering to the red dot among all of the white stars. The planet Mars seems like a single eyeball watching my every move, watching me suffer. Maybe it's a punishment for stealing its soil and its inhabitants. I wander alone across the barren desert, surrounded by a landscape of death, just like the rovers on Mars do. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.